So we're talking about community today. We're in uh, week six of our of our ten week series. Uh, we've got four weeks left, and we're talking about disciple making disciples and what that looks like and what's the mark. What are the marks of a disciple? So the first two weeks we talked about a passion for Jesus. The second two weeks we talked about knowledge of the scriptures and. How do we know Christ? How do we know the scriptures and the importance of that? And then last week we introduced the third mark of a disciple, which is community. Living in community. And so last week we talked about the importance of community. We're going to do that a little bit more today as we talk about living in community. And so um, I'm excited to share this message with you this morning. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn to the book of Acts chapter 2. That's where we're going to be today. The book of Acts chapter 2. But to kind of set this up, I was reading this past week, and this author, who um, happened to be a pastor, shared this story. He said, I know a husband and wife who were growing spiritually and were very active in their church. But when the man was promoted at work, they moved into a higher financial bracket, they found a new set of friends, and became more sophisticated in their attitude toward the things of God. Soon, golf and tennis took the place of Sunday morning worship. Chances are it was a Southern church, right? They could play golf and tennis year-round. The Bible study group they attended went by the wayside. When their pastor visited them and urged them to return to the Lord, they let him know that, their, that his warnings were not welcome. Things had shifted. Things had changed. We believe here at Summit Church that community is important. We believe community is important. We believe life is meant to be lived in one word, together. Everybody say that, together. together. We believe life is meant to be lived together. And you can live life on your own, you can live life other ways, but it's not as sweet, it's not as good, it's not as special. Life is meant to be lived together. And so today I want us to look at how to live in community, how to live together in community with other believers. But here's the tension. Here's the tension that we've got to come to grips with this morning. We are one of, if not the most, connected cultures in history. We get notifications every hour or every 15 minutes, however you have that set up, and some of you are, are like, oh wait, I can change that? Yes, you can, and we've got some folks that would love to help you with that. Um, it's called our youth ministry. But we get, we get notifications every hour or so to our phones about the latest news, weather, sports, what our friends are doing, and comments on the latest photo that we posted. We're connected in a way that we've never been connected before. But yet, we are still some of the most disconnected people ever. We might be able to know a few things about a lot of people, but we don't have deep relationships with almost anyone. And the problem with that, the reason that that's a tension that we have to come to grips with this morning, is that God created us for community. God created us for deep, everybody say deep, deep relationships. Life is not meant to be alone. I'm convinced, and this is the bottom line of the message today, so if you're taking notes, write this down. I'm convinced that the best shot that you and I have of following Jesus, the best shot that you and I have of making it through the storms of this life is when we do life together. That's our best shot. I believe that. And I think you believe that. I think we all know that it's true. We just don't know how to get to that place. And the reason I can say I think that you believe that is because you're here this morning. You're here this morning. You have decided to take up an hour or so of your life to be here this morning. And so chances are, if you're not here for, you know, because of family or because you were made to, you know, you're here by your own, you know, willingness, right? If you're here by your own willingness, which is probably at least 30% of us, <laughs> then you're looking for something. Something in you believes that this is important. Something in you believes that this is valuable. You may not even know why. You may not even know how. Uh, you, you may even think that this may not be the right place, but something in you is looking for something that God intended to be found here, whether it's being found here yet or not by you. And here's the reality with that tension. We all have something that keeps us from community. We all have something that keeps us from going into something more than surface level relationships. 
Has anybody ever seen the movie Wonder? Wonder? Okay, a couple of you. A couple of you. It's a movie about this little boy named Augie. And Augie had um, something happen where he had some... Um, he had some deformities on his face, and he had a, a bunch of surgeries and stuff like that. And Augie, by his own admission, didn't look normal in the movie. And so Augie struggled with school, and Julia Roberts played Augie's mom. You may have read the book and not seen the movie. Um, I'm more of a movie guy when it comes to things like this. But my kids read the book in school, and so we got to go to a movie night and see the movie. And, um, and, and I was the dad over there just sobbing by the end of it, like... Just, anyway, um, it's that kind of movie. And, um, and, and in the movie, uh, Augie wears this astronaut helmet everywhere he goes in public because he's, he's, he's intimidated to be in public because of what people are going to say about him and all of that. And so when he goes to school, Dad says he can't wear the astronaut helmet. So Augie talks in this clip as I was watching it this morning, as I was watching it to kind of refresh my memory for this moment right here for this story. Um, it, it struck me because every time Augie wasn't wearing his helmet, he just looked down. He looked down. He didn't want anybody to see his face. He, he, he in fact, says you can tell a lot of people, you can tell a lot about people by looking at their shoes, where they've been, how traveled they are, because he, all he did was just look down. Except for one day a year. Can you imagine what day it is? Can you guess what day it is? Those of you that have seen the movie, don't give it away. Halloween. Why? Because it's the one day where it was okay to wear a mask. And so Augie, the day of Halloween, jumps out of his house, leaps off of his front steps, runs up the street, right? Whereas every other day he kind of, you know, walked like this, head down, down. All of his, you know, everything about him was down, defeated. Runs into school, gives everybody high fives. He's walking with his head held Hi. And in light of our small group conversations, if you've been walking through the cure with us, and in light of our message today, that's so, and many of us do that and live that way, wearing a mask. Because we've bought into the belief that wearing a mask is more comfortable. Not allowing people to get to know the real me is okay because they might not like the real me. We're going to talk about that more in just a few minutes, right? So if I can just wear a mask, maybe people will like me. I can walk with my head up. But you know the thing I noticed about the mask this morning that was depicted in this movie? Augie walks into the classroom and because nobody knows it's Augie because he's wearing a mask, because they all got to dress up on this day, he hears some other students talking about him and picking on him and making fun of him because of his face. And they even looked around to make sure Augie wasn't in the room before they said those things. But you know what I've noticed about the mask this morning that I hadn't noticed before watching the movie? As much as we may feel more comfortable wearing a mask and think it helps us, a mask never protects us from pain. It's still there. It's still there. It's still there. And we're still able to get hurt even if we're wearing a mask. And so, this morning, before we jump into the book of Acts, I want us to look at the early church's example of community and what God says about community. But again, before we get there, I want us to look at some barriers in our lives of community. We did this a little bit last week, but I want to go a little bit deeper with a couple of these because I think it's important. And the first one that I think we can all relate to is busyness. Busyness is a barrier to community because I don't have time to get in deeper relationships because fill in the blank for you. I don't have time to get in deeper relationships. I don't have time because of work, because of school, because of sports, because of kids, hobbies, projects, so on and so forth. We filled our lives with so much stuff that we don't have room for anything else. But as I've been kind of pressing back into this whole idea of busyness and this whole idea of time and, and how we don't have time and, and things like that, these are some of the things I read this past week from an author that I found pretty interesting when it comes to busyness and the barrier of busyness and community. First one is this. It's not about having time, it's about making time. Hmm. It's not about having time, it's about making time. And then get this, he followed up just a little bit later with this. No one is too busy. Huh, he doesn't know my life. But quickly after he said, it's just a matter of priorities. 
No one is too busy. It's just a matter of priorities. It's not about having time. It's about making time. No one is too busy. It's just a matter of priorities. You know, it's interesting, isn't it? It's interesting how in our busy lives, and listen, I, there, there's no judgment in this. There's no judgment in this because I know I've been guilty of this too, right? I'm too busy for this. I'm too busy for that. But yet, somehow, I find my way to the recliner right as the Red Sox game is starting. Or right as the Patriots kick off. Or right as this. Or right as that. Or somehow, I find my way to the table while the meal is still hot. It's not about making time. It's about making priorities. We make time for the things that are important to us. We make time for the things that are valuable. We make time. Number two, apathy. Apathy. Now, listen, real quick, real quick. We've already talked about this with Pastor Ian and how he tried to throw me under the bus there just a minute ago. You're in church, so you can't lie. Anybody need to step out? No, I'm just kidding. Um, You're in church, so you can't lie. How many of you have had this thought? I just don't want to. Don't, don't raise your hands. You don't have to raise your hands. Okay, it's just, just reflection today. Okay. But how many of you have had this thought? I just don't want to. I'm really not interested in a small group. I don't really want to go out to dinner with them tonight. I don't really see the benefit of opening up to others. I'm just not sure I care about this whole community thing. Come on. Have you felt that? Yeah, me too. I've been there. I've been there. I've questioned those things. I've had those same thoughts. And I think what it comes down to when it comes to the barrier of apathy is that we just don't value community because we think we can do without it. The third barrier I want to talk about is this. And this will be the last one. Scared to be vulnerable. Scared to be vulnerable. See, a lot of us have questions that go something like this. Is this really a safe place? If I tell them who I really am, are they still going to like me? Are they going to shut me out? Are they going to kick me out? If I tell them what I'm struggling with, I'll probably just get asked to never come back or whatever the case may be. I can't show them the real me. See, some of us feel that way. Some of us feel that way this morning because we've been hurt in the past by what somebody did when we showed them the real us. Some form of this probably describes most of this in this room. We keep our relationships at surface level, safe. We keep people at arm's length, not allowing anyone too close because we're afraid of what they'll see. But the life-changing community that the Bible talks about cannot happen when we don't let people into our lives. Let me say that again. The life-changing community that the Bible talks about cannot happen if we don't let people into our lives. Yeah, but Travis, you don't understand. Try me. And I'm asking for the next few minutes. Because some of you may have had some hurts that are so deep and some cuts that are still bleeding. To where you've already tuned this message out. Because of a fear to be vulnerable. Or because of an apathy. Or because of a you fill in the blank. But I am convinced that God's plan for you is community. That God's plan for me is community. That God's plan for us is community. The life-changing community that the Bible talks about cannot happen when we don't let people into our lives. And the one thing we have to look at before the church's example is something that we need to recognize. The direction you choose for your life will determine the target you hit. The direction that you choose for your life will determine the target you hit. Here's what I mean. If you choose a busy life, a safe life, if you never put effort into community, guess what? You'll never have deep relationships. You don't get anywhere by accident. If you do not intentionally choose to pursue community, you'll not end up with it. I get it. It's tough. 
But if we want the best shot at following Jesus in our life, then we have to set the course of our lives. We've got to get through the barriers. Acts chapter 2. After Jesus rose from the dead, He hung around for 40 days and saw over 500 people. Everybody say 500. 500 people, which is one of the strongest evidences of our faith. Think about it. 500 people say Jesus, saw Jesus after resurrection and say the same thing. That's tough to make up. We take 500 people to a, an event and they all leave saying something different today. So that was a miracle in itself, right? 500 people saw Jesus post-resurrection and all say the same thing. What an evidence of faith. What an evidence of faith. After the 40 days were up, Jesus ascended into heaven, Acts chapter 1, and all of a sudden these new believers were left to figure out what to do now. They were left to carry out all that Jesus had told them. And that's what the whole book of Acts is about. Luke's second book, the book of Acts. It's a book of history about the early church. So what I want us to do for the remainder of our time together this morning is to look at the community that existed in the first few years of that church to see a beautiful model of what the church was intended to be, what that community was intended to be, what this community is intended to be. Acts chapter 2, verses 42 through 47. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship and to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily, day by day, those who were being saved. See, these, these are the very first Christians. They're the very first church. There's no one else. And when we say church, understand that this was very different than what happens here on a Sunday morning. They didn't have lights and fancy music. They didn't have chairs to sit in. They didn't have a welcome center to get info in that fancy little cup gift thing that we have, the, the, the mason jar looking thing with our fancy logo on it, right? See, I just told you, if you're a first time visitor, that's what's coming for you right there. If you're not a first-time visitor, you can pay 75 bucks for it, and we'll, we'll, we'll give you <laughs> yours today. It's high-quality cup, man. Hand wash only. All right. <laughs> but they didn't even have a Bible as we know it. They didn't even have the Scriptures like this as we know it. And to make matters worse, many of them were going to lose their families and be kicked out of their communities because of their new beliefs. And from the very beginning, they recognized that the best shot they had of following Jesus and getting through what was coming to them is by doing it together. By doing life together. You see, I think, I think some of our comforts take some of that away, don't they? I mean, when you think about the dependency that they had to have on each other, thinking about all the things that they were risking. I mean, we, we talked about that a couple weeks ago when I talked about my friend from India, right? And we talked about how if, if, if life was on the line, if things were at risk for coming here this morning, how many of us would still show up? How many of us are passionate enough and, and care enough about this right here, what we're doing, the fellowship, the community that is the church that if there were those real sacrifices and real risks, how many of us would still be here? I think sometimes we get distracted, we get distracted today by what church has become. I refer to it a lot of times as the machine that is church. The expectations that we have on each other that aren't fair, but are reality the perceptions we have of each other that become reality. We become distracted so much today by what the church has become. Don't get me wrong. Don't get me wrong. Don't hear me wrong. Man, Sundays are great. What we do here is great. We've man, I love the fact that we've set up the baptistry two out of the last three or four Sundays, man. That's awesome. We're seeing amazing things, but the beauty of the church is not in a Sunday service.
The beauty of the church is not in a Sunday service. It's in the community. We see this in the early church because they didn't have anything else. They had each other. So they set this model up that's been in place in churches ever since. I love what David Platt does. Some of you may never have even heard of David Platt. David Platt wrote the book Radical, and he's written some other books, and he was a pastor of the Church of Brook Hills down in Alabama, and then he left and was the president of the International Mission Board, and now he's left that, and he's something at McLean Bible Church down in Washington, D.C. area. I'm not sure if he's a teaching pastor or the senior pastor or what, but he preaches on a regular basis there. And David Platt, I, I think I talked about the book Radical last week or two weeks ago, some of the things he said in there that were amazing. But one of the things he does, and he's actually bringing back this year, is this thing called Secret Church. And every Good Friday, he, he kind of emulates what it's like to be at a secret church. They take all the chairs away. <gasps> they, turn the, they turn the air conditioning or the heat off. They, they, they kind of make it cold and, and as damp as they possibly can in a controlled environment, right? And they, and they take as much of the sound away as possible as they can. They still record it, which, so, I mean hear me, right? But they're making efforts, right? They, they make efforts to do this. And, and here's my favorite part. Here's my favorite part. He teaches for six hours. And every time he's done a secret church, he's gone over in one night. No chairs, no lights. They have flashlights around and stuff like that because they're trying to emulate this this environment, right? I have a pastor friend of mine. I talk about him all the time. The, my, my pastor buddy over in Lincoln, New Hampshire, um, he's the Loon Mountain chaplain. And he had a Sunday morning where they were, they were doing some things and, and, and uh, they were a portable church. And he said, we're, we're going to try something new this Sunday. He said, we're not going to set up any chairs. We're not going to set up any chairs. We're going to have the chair rack over in the corner. And so what we're going to ask people to do is to get their chair when they walk in. For, their, for them and their family. Three families left his church after that Sunday morning because they had to get their own chair. Isn't that unbelievable? Sad? How used to these comforts that we've become. See what I mean when I say we've become distracted by what the church has become today? So what does that community look like? What does the community that God intended us for, that God created us for, look like? Four things. They devoted themselves to the fellowship. Excuse me. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. Number one, the apostles' teaching. They listened to the apostles' teaching. And, and I want you to notice one word there that's kind of easy for us to gloss over in this passage. Luke says they devoted themselves. They devoted themselves. They put themselves in there. They put themselves out there. I, 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 don't, I don't picture that as they, they walked in safely with their masks on to try it out, to kick the tires, to test the waters type of thing. No, 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 no. When I read the word devoted there, it makes me think that they dove in, that they, that they put themselves in fully. In fact, that word devoted there means uh, to, to loving, uh, hang on, hang on, hang on, very loving, loyal, right? And so they plugged in, they plugged themselves in, they devoted themselves to these things. And the first thing they devoted themselves to was the apostles' teaching. This would have been, this would have been for us like a Sunday morning sermon. This would have been the equivalent to listening to a Sunday morning sermon. But for the, from the very beginning, from the very beginning, we see it set as the church learns and is taught together. The point isn't that they were getting information. I mean, sometimes I think that's valuable, though, right? But that wasn't the point. Rather, they were learning, being encouraged, and challenged together. Challenged together. So they listened to the apostles teach. That was part of the community that, that, that was called the church here in Acts chapter 2. They listened to the apostles teach. Number two, they had fellowship. Now, I want to talk about this word for just a minute. They had fellowship. Because this is kind of a weird word with a lot of connotations, right? This is kind of a weird word. When, when I was growing up in the church, and I heard the word fellowship, you know what I immediately thought of? Food. But not only food. I'm talking mass amounts of food. All, all right? All the fried chicken, all the mashed potatoes, all the, all, the, all the stuff, right? Mass quantities of food. Whenever somebody said fellowship, people went cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs because they knew that mass amounts of food were coming their way. 
But I don't think this word fellowship is very well understood. But here's how we should think about it. Here's what this word really means. Think about your best friend. For some of you, for reasons we've already talked about, that's easier than others. But think about your best friend. Think about the things you do with them. That's fellowship. You laugh together, you cry together, you go on trips together, you share secrets, you, share, you encourage one another, you challenge one another. And in this case, you push them to look more like Jesus. Which is where the Bible comes in. See, I think when it comes to fellowship, here's where we try really, really hard to reflect the Acts, reflect the Acts church, but we fall short is that we try to do fellowship within the church and our community without this. But here's the deal. Church, we can't have biblical fellowship without... Right? The Bible. At some point in that meal, at some point in that conversation, at some point in that fellowship, it's got to turn from your thoughts and your opinions and your preferences and your desires and your past history to Scripture. At some point in that conversation, at some point in that relationship, at some point, it has to transition to Scripture. I remember Russ explaining this to me for the first time about discipleship, right? And, and when Russ was explaining it to me for the first time, he, he, he equated it to that awkward first date. Anybody ever been on one of those? Okay, a couple. <laughs> All right. It's always good when Russ's wife raises her hand the highest. All right, good. It's a good thing. That was awesome, Jen. Thank you. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and, and so he equated, it, he equated it to that awkward first date, right? Where you're sitting there, you're sitting there, and you're talking about something, you're talking about something, you're talking about something. You've met with this person a couple times because maybe it's not something you bring up on the, on the first date, but it's that, it's that moment where you're like, okay, I'm ready for this relationship to go to the next level. I'm ready, I'm ready, I'm ready. And you're sitting there, and the conversation's done. You've talked about everything. You've talked about the two games on Friday night that happened. Get it? 18 innings in one game. The two games in one that happened on Friday night. You've talked about all that stuff. You've talked about how Mookie Betts fed the poor, right? How Mookie Betts looked more like the church than the church. Anyway, um, so, and so you talked about all these things, right? You talked about all these things, and, and, and then you get to this thing. You get to this place. Conversation's silent. you got one or two ways. you got one or two ways you can go. Abort, abort, abort. Hey, that was great. Have a great week. We'll, see, we'll do this again sometime. This is nice right or do you want to talk about the Bible you want to talk what have you read the Bible you know the Bible the book right and for some reason somehow that's even awkward to talk about with your church community not for all of us I know some of you are like man I do this every day multiple times a day but for some, for other for others of us that's a struggle to bring the Bible into our everyday conversation. But man, once you do it, it's sweet. I'll never forget the first time. Gorm grind, it doesn't even exist anymore. Sitting, oh man, mourn, tear. That rocket fuel. Anybody, okay, anyway, I'm back. Sitting at the Gorm grind with a guy that I've met with for, I'm ashamed to tell you, like six months. We met consistently. We talked a lot about a lot of things. And then one day, I was like, hey, have you ever read your Bible? <laughs> and he looked at me like I had six heads. Yeah, I'm a pastor on your staff. <laughs> right? What are you getting out of that? And man, it never turned back. It was awesome. Some of the best conversations I ever had with that young man were around Scripture. If we're going to have fellowship, and fellowship is sweet, and fellowship doesn't always, because then you get people on the opposite end of the spectrum where
where it becomes legalism. Right? But if the Bible is not a part of our fellowship, not a part of our relationship on some level, then we're missing out on biblical fellowship in the way that God intended it to be, which is a piece of community the way that God intended it to be. You got that? So they listened to the apostles teach. They had fellowship. They experienced fellowship. There's a lot packed into that one word. Number three, they broke bread. Mmm. They broke bread. This has two implications. Number one, if you think back to the last meal that Jesus had with his disciples right before he went to the cross, right before he ate with them, he took the bread and he broke it. And then he told them to do this in remembrance of him. In other words, whenever they eat, they were supposed to break bread to remember what Jesus had done for them. It's not a coincidence that Luke, who was at the last meal with Jesus, who wrote the book of Acts, used the same word as Jesus used when he was talking there in the upper room with his disciples. Luke is telling us that they broke bread to remember what Jesus did for them. Which is very practically why we pray before a meal, right? So that we can pause. Because it's easy to grab that food and start pouncing on it and devouring it. Before you know it, boom, you're done. Never giving a thought to the provision where that came from or thankfulness to God. Right? But that's why we pause and we sit and we say, man, God, thank you for this. Thank you for providing this. Thank you for giving me the the freedom in life so that I can enjoy these things. Because of your sacrifice. That's the first implication. Number two, the second implication is that community can come and a lot of times does come from eating together. Right? From eating together. I love eating and then I love eating with people. But we've lost some of this today. And if you do studies, and this is a whole different message, I did this message about two years ago, floored me as I prepared for it, as I studied for it. We often just eat today around our TV. Families go out to eat, and everyone just stares at their phones. But eating together historically has been very significant. And sharing a meal might be one of the biggest community builders that there is. So, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and then last but not least, to the prayers. They prayed. In this community, in the community that God has created us for, they prayed together. And see, here's the deal. Today, we view prayer, a lot of us view prayer. Again, uh, I'll try to be careful about involving all of us because I know some people, people don't share that view. But for a lot of us today, we view prayer as something that we do alone by ourselves or as we just talked about, right before a meal, or by a pastor in public. It's always funny. No, never mind. Okay, keep going. And while all those ways of prayer are valid, we've lost the importance of praying together. Prayer in the early church wasn't just something people did alone. wasn't just something they did at a certain time. It was something that they lived for. Something that they practiced together. They would actually pray for each other and with each other. You know, as I was thinking about that, I was thinking about how, you know, we don't see the prayer meeting. We don't see the designated time. It just says that they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Actually, it says to the prayers. Right? To the prayers. I mean, when I sit around with my small group on Sunday nights, I'm going to miss this tonight. So anybody in my small group, just come up to me after chunk or treat and just tell me, Right? But one of my favorite things we do in my small group, we have to take about a half hour, we have to make sure we stop the discussion and t- so that we can get to it. But my favorite thing that we do is we walk around my living room, not literally, but we, we go around the living room with each person. Although that would be fun if we walked around. The, anyway, um, but, but we, we go around to each person and we say, how can we pray for you this week? How can we pray for each other this week? And every person goes around and they share a prayer request. And it's beautiful. And let me tell you what doesn't happen. At least it better not happen. If I ever find out it happens, then we're going to have some real issues in, in my small group, right? But what doesn't happen is that we hear a prayer request from Stacy, and then on Monday morning I come in and say, man, you won't believe what Stacy's dealing with right now because that's called gossip and that's sin. And the Bible talks a lot about that in scripture which contributes you may have been on the reciprocating end of that which contributes to some of those barriers we talked about earlier 
is that we don't really want to find out prayer requests so that we can pray for each other and be in community together and devote ourselves to praying for each other. We just want your prayer requests so that we know your dirt. So that we can feel more than superior to you and more spiritual than you. Right? Anybody ever experienced that? Just show of hands. Really? Anybody ever experienced that? I've experienced that. Okay, great. Good. All right, so we're in the same place. This is a safe place. Um, <laughs> But what would it look like if when we devoted ourselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to the prayers, if we prayed as we went? I love the picture of Jesus. Hey, you guys go ahead. I got to go pray. I need it. I'm running on E. I got to pause. I got to time out. Go pray. Moses set the model of that back in Scripture in Exodus. Hey, Israelites, you guys stay down here, run amok. i got to go up to the mountain and meet with Jesus. Not a direct translation. Paraphrase. But what would it look like if just Summit Church, if, 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 we, if we devoted ourselves to prayer in such a way where that just became the norm, right? Man, I'm just really struggling. Can we pray? We're in a Hanford parking lot. Yeah, and? Man, wouldn't that be awesome? We don't have to wait till 6.30 on a Wednesday night, which is awesome. I love our prayer meeting. Love those guys. We don't have to wait till our small group on Sunday night. It's awesome. Prayer ought to be a vital part of every small group that we have, every community that gets together. That's Summit Church. Uh, prayer ought to be a part of it. That's why we want you to come at 3 o'clock today if you're a part of our Trunk or Treat because we want to have everything set up so that at 3.40 we can come into this room, we can shut the bounce houses off, and we can pray for everything that's going to happen from 4 to 6. We want that to be a part of everything we do and just not a designated time. Or something that you put on your card and drop in the offering basket. These four things are what the church was built for. Built on. These elements of community. And do you notice anything in common with these four practices established by the early church? They all have strong elements of community. And they did these things together. One of the biggest mistakes we can make is thinking that we can do life alone. One of the biggest mistakes we can make is thinking we can do life alone. But here's the reality. We don't stumble into community. We have to intentionally set the direction for our life. And I want you to see what this led to for the early church. If you look at verses 43 and on, it says, And awe came upon every soul. They worshipped. Many signs and wonders were done through the apostles. And then look at verses 44 and 45. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. They got outside their walls. They got outside the, the walls and into the community and were sharing and generosity. And that was a value for them and they were in unity on those things and day by day attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes they received their food with glad and generous hearts praising God and having favor with all the people praising God and having favor with all the people and the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved that's what community leads to is this awe this unity, this favor, that's what community leads to. See, I believe you need community. I believe I need community. I believe that we need community. That's the model that the early church set up throughout the Bible, verse after verse. The writers talk about the importance of community. Life apart from the help and support of others is hard. In fact, in fact, if you look at John 17, which is Jesus' prayer on his way to the cross, he prays to the Father. You know what he prays for? He prays for three groups of people. The first, he prays for his disciples. Jesus prays for his disciples. He said, I've completed the work you gave me to do, Father. I've made disciples. I pray for them in verses 1 through 5. Then verses 6 through 19, Jesus prays for himself. And then verses 20 through the end of the chapter in John 17, Jesus prays for all who believe, which I think is pretty fascinating. Because you know what that means? If you're a believer in Jesus Christ this morning, you were on the mind of Jesus on His way to the cross to bear your sin and shame. You were on His mind. 
as he prayed for all those who would believe. And you know what he prays for? I want us to look at it. John chapter 17, verse, uh, verse 20. And it's going to be on your screen. He says, I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe. There it is in me through their word, that they may be. Here's the prayer of Jesus when you're on his mind, on his way to the cross, to his Father, that they may be. Everybody say it. Oh, that was, come on now. That they may be one. one. That they may be one. Why? Let's read. Just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, reflecting the unity of the Father and the Son, that they also may be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The most powerful testimony that the church has to a lost and dying world that's going to hell is our unity and community. Because in that, we reflect Jesus and His relationship with the Father. The most powerful testimony that we have to a lost and dying world that is desperate and searching for community, I believe that with everything in me, is our community. That's pretty powerful, isn't it? That puts a lot of things into perspective for me. Oh, but I'm, I'm not comfortable. They took the speaker stands away. They mounted the speakers. <laughs> Change. Some of you are like, I didn't even notice that. <laughs> Doesn't it look good? I think it looks good. I think it looks good. You get the point. You get the point. You get the point. People see Jesus in the way that we treat each other. The way that we love each other. In the way that we support each other. In the way that we pray together. In the way that we break bread together. In the way that we devote ourselves to the teaching. In the way that we devote ourselves and we fellowship together and have fun together. People see Jesus reflected in our unity in our community. I don't know about you, but that puts some things into perspective for me that this was on the mind of Christ on His way to the cross for the church. That all those who believe would be one so that the, so that the world may know. So that the world may know. So maybe it's time that we break down the walls the barriers that are holding us back for community. I don't know what it is for you. I'd love to know. Maybe it's fear. Maybe it's busyness. Maybe it's apathy. Maybe we don't even recognize the importance of community yet. Hopefully over the last couple weeks you've seen it. So what do we do with this? Four things really quickly. Number one, set the direction of your life. Take a risk. Take the mask off. I, I can't read John 17 verses 20 through 25 and think it's not worth it. To take a risk. To set the course of my life that I'm going to be in, in more engaged. I was listening to this podcast one time. I don't even remember who it was, but the guy said, my wife and I were feeling isolated with our kids. We had made our kids our worship, and we were just feeling isolated. We didn't do life with anybody anymore, and so we set a goal that in 2000-something, 17 or 18, we were going to have 100 families over for dinner in our house in that year and be more intentional in community. You know what happened? They didn't make their goal. You know Why? Because they found community in a few, few of the first families that they got together with, and they just, that was so sweet. He said, we had over 100 meals together. It just wasn't with 100 different families. Bummer. We found community, but we didn't reach our goal. But they took a risk. But they took a risk. Because they set it as a goal. They set the direction for their life. Say no to something that isn't as important. Give it a shot. It's awesome. 
man, I've, I've, I've started this. Some of you are like, yeah, you still got a long way to go. I know, but I've started, okay? I'm in six months in, and I'm loving it. It's awesome to say no. It's amazing. You know why? Because it gives life to other things. It gives life to important things. I'm not sure what your barriers are. I'm not sure what's keeping you from community, but I know your life will benefit from having it. So set the course for your life. Set the direction for your life for community. Number two, find your people. Now, here's the deal. Find your people. We've got to talk about this for just a second. The first thing you need to do is find your people. And as great as our Sunday mornings are here, and they are, I love Sunday mornings here. There's no place I'd rather be, and I'm not just saying that because I'm the pastor here. This place is awesome. But if all you ever do is come a few times a month on a Sunday, you're missing out on the more important aspect of church. And when I say find your people, and, and listen, I know we joke around about this, and some people take me too seriously when I say things like this, but we've had a lot of fun at Jim Carlson's, Carl, Carlson's expense the last couple weeks, and all you other Yankees fans out there. <laughs> okay? By the way, it's, it's, Jim's an elder of our church, and so I had to repent to him Monday night at our elder meeting. <laughs> And I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to thank him again today. He turned 21 today. Isn't that awesome? Jim Cross turned 21 today. So, anyway. Um, but, but, but when you find your people, it's not about sports teams. It's not about favorite foods or this or that. It's not about, about anybody. It's not about any of that. In fact, some of the sweetest community I've found has been with people where, where that's not even part of the conversation. Like, that's not even a part of the... Uh, we, we laugh and we have fun with that stuff and all of that, but, but those things aren't vital to community. Some of the sweetest community I've had is with people that don't even know the movies I talk about or the music I listen to or the sports I'm interested in. But they're interested in the Jesus I'm interested in. They're passionate about the Jesus I'm passionate about. Find your people. Number three, share with your people. Share with your people. Set the direction of your life. Find your people. Then you've got to open up and you've got to share your story. Yeah, but pastor, the last time I did that, I know. But maybe that was what God intended for you to teach you something. I don't know about you, but whenever I've been burned before, and I've been burned, I've been burned. I can identify with most of you probably in this room about those burnings. But whenever I've been burned, you know something I've realized? I've learned something. I've learned something that almost immediately God uses to teach through me to someone else. And so God, if that's what you want for me, this is yours anyway. Everything here is yours anyway. I'm just a steward. So God, if you want to take me through something really, really hard that makes me doubt everything I ever am and everything I have ever wanted, if you want to take me there and take me to a place where... where where I feel like nothing matters anymore, or feel like I just want to quit everything or run from everything and go back groceries. If you want to take me to that place so that you can use that for your glory in someone else's life, so be it. So be it. Because I think He gets it. And I think He's there for me through the process as I think he is for you. So I don't think we can use that as an excuse. I think that's part of the risk. And it is a risk. So we've got to set the course. We've got to find our people. We've got to share with our people. And then number four, we've got to invite others to be our people too. Invite others to be our people too. See, growing up in the South, in North Kakalaki, Okay, where we're baptized in sweet tea. All right? <laughs> growing, growing, up in, growing up in the South, growing up in the South, we have this thing down there where if, if we talk about something in your presence, it's assumed you're invited. Okay? So like if we talk about the Red Sox game, you might as well consider that your invitation to come over to the house and watch the Red Sox game. Now, I've been in Maine almost eight years. That doesn't apply anymore. <laughs> Okay, I just need to make that clear. 
But growing up and then coming to New England, that was an adjustment for me because I just assumed when I got here that I would talk about things and, and, and then I would expect people to come over and watch the game with me and nobody would show up and I didn't think I had any friends. But then, thankfully, I married someone way smarter than me who is a Mainer. Right? He said, no, you, honey, you have to invite them. People won't come without an invitation. An invita-, and I'm like, well, that's dumb. <laughs> I'm inviting them. If I, wasn't, if I didn't want them to come, I wouldn't talk about this stuff around them. <laughs> Again, not true anymore, okay? But, <laughs> but you get the point. See, a lot of times we assume that people are invited into our community, but they don't ever feel welcome into our community because we haven't actually invited them into our community. Hmm. So many people come in and out of our community never feeling welcome because we've never told them so. I was, I was at church a month and a half ago. I, I remember exactly who it was. And I was just overwhelmed by emotion for you because I, I, I love you and I care about you that I got up at the end of the service. And it was one of those days where I just said, you know what, guys, I love you. And you need to know that. Somebody came up to me at the end of the service and said, I've been in church for a really long time and I've never heard a pastor tell his congregation that he loved them. Now, I know that those pastors probably love their congregations, but we can't assume that. Can't assume that. So we've got to take a risk. Right? We've got to set the course. We've got to set the direction of our life. Community. Find our people, share with our people, and invite others to be our people. It was the prayer of Jesus. The worship team is going to come. I asked you last Sunday... I asked you last Sunday, and I know we've gone long both services today, but I'm not sorry because I feel like this was the word of God for today. But I asked you last Sunday on a scale of 1 to 10, how important is community in your life? How important is community in your life? How important is community in your life? And today, I just want to ask you this question. What would it look like if we became so passionate about living in community that we reflected the early church outside these four walls? I I referenced it earlier. I didn't talk about it in the first service. But man, I'm really convicted when the world looks more like the church than the church does. Like I was really moved the other night when I saw in the news that this baseball player had a bunch of food delivered to his house and they couldn't eat it all so he took it down to the Boston Public Library and just fed the homeless. I thought, wow, that's the church's job. And what would it look like if Summit Church devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching? to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to the prayers. And we became a reflection of God and His relationship with His Son and the oneness there. We became a reflection of that oneness by being oneness to the world that we live in. That's my prayer for our church. I can't think of a passage of Scripture that is more a part of my prayer life for this church than this one. God, let that be so.